Today we're going to talk about dreams and where they come from within your brain. Dreaming is a surreal and fascinating human experience. It can be fun, odd, strangely terrifying. But from the beginning of time, humans have always tried to understand where dreams come from and why they occur. From ancient Egypt to the theories of Freud and Jung, truly objective analysis and research into dreams is quite difficult. The ancient Egyptians came up with the concept of dream incubation. If you're going through a tough time in your life, you'd go to sleep in a temple. If you had dreams after you'd woken up the next morning, you would tell the master of secret things, who would interpret these dreams and advise you accordingly. In ancient Greek times, such temples were called Asclepions, such as the famous one at Epidaurus. They also employed a similar technique with ill patients, sometimes spending weeks or months in such temples, hoping that the right healing dreams would come up and give them good health. Skip forward to the last century and I'm sure everyone has heard of Sigmund Freud and his theories on why we dream. To him, all dreams held some kind of significance and they often reflected your deepest, darkest, dirtiest desires or fears. These were often erotic and they had private connotations and that's why these theories were often popularised and satirised. One of Freud's students, Carl Jung, thought that this wasn't quite right. Instead of dreams representing the stuff that we desired deep down, he thought that dreams were your mind sending you a message, that something wasn't quite right and that basically you needed to sort yourself out. More recent theories expand on this, telling us that dreams are there to regulate your emotions, help to consolidate your memories and to help you learn. Some researchers also think that it's a biological defence mechanism, helping you repeatedly simulate and prepare for threatening and dangerous situations. Learning about these theories is fun and super interesting, but as we're getting better and better insights into how the brain works, surely we should know by now if there's a neuroanatomical basis for our dreams. Well, we know a lot more about how sleep itself works, and dreams are obviously intricately linked to sleep, so let's look at sleep physiology first. Every night you have two types of sleep cycle, rapid eye movement or REM and non-rapid eye movement cycles or NREM. These last between 90 to 100 minutes. REM sleep is characterized by rapid eye movements, global high frequency and low amplitude electroencephalogram activity or EEG activity, and this is very similar to the waking state. As well as these eye movements, you can get an increased heart rate, respiratory activity, so increased breathing, and muscle atonia, or temporary muscular paralysis. When people first started conducting research into dreams and sleep physiology, it was thought that dreams always happened during REM sleep because people would most often report their dreams straight after waking up from a REM cycle. We now know that this isn't quite true. If someone has a problem with the frontal lobes of their brain, they still get REM sleep, but the dreams stop completely. If someone gets a problem with their brain stem, they don't get REM cycles anymore, but they can still dream. The kinds of dreams people experience during REM are vivid, emotionally heightened experiences that are sometimes super bizarre. They seem to reflect the dreamer's mood and personality, and the dreamer certainly doesn't know where they are, what time it is, or what the heck is going on, even though it feels like they're actually awake. What's really interesting is that these dreamers don't report pleasure, pain, smell, or taste. Even though dream research is in the past mostly focused on the study of REM cycles, Awakenings from NREM sleep has also given us reports of dreams. NREM sleep is now commonly divided into three different stages, N1, N2, and N3. N3 sleep is known as deep sleep or slow wave sleep and is physiologically quite distinct from REM cycles. NREM sleep is characterized by global low frequency and high amplitude EEG signals. You get slow, regular breathing and a slower heart rate, as well as a low blood pressure. 
About 80% of people who wake up from an N1 cycle do report dreams, but they tend to be much shorter than those following periods of REM sleep. Another thing that you need to talk about when talking about sleep and dream physiology is sleep inertia, and that's the feeling of grogginess as soon as you've woken up really abruptly, and it's when you wake up from a deep sleep, or NREM stage N3. And this sleep inertia can make the reports of these dreams really difficult for researchers to understand. So what kind of dreams do you typically get when you're dreaming in NREM? These tend to be more fragmented, more thought-like. They tend to relate to your current concerns, unlike the vivid, hallucinatory and visual content of REM dreams. When you wake up after dreaming in the N3 stage, they're much more plausible dreams, they're conceptual, and they typically involve greater volitional control or you being able to actually do stuff within that dream. Now, when we talk about dreaming and its underlying neurological changes, it's really difficult for researchers to figure out where dreaming actually arises from in the brain because the dreaming itself is pretty much independent of any kind of external stimulus. A researcher can't do something to the dreamer to try and start or stop dreams. They just have to wait and see if it happened or not and hope that the person that's dreaming can give you a proper account of what happened, if they even remember it at all. Let's first take a look at the kinds of dreams that you get during REM sleep phases because these are the most clearly defined in terms of what parts of the brain are actually activated. So the parts of the brain that are activated actually correspond to subjective experiences of dreaming and vivid imagery and storylines. Positron emission tomography or PET scans show that the whole brain metabolism is actually really similar during REM sleep as it is to when you're completely awake and EEG signals during REM and wakefulness are also really similar. Despite this, there are several brain regions that are particularly active during REM. These include the occipitotemporal visual association areas, and this is probably responsible for why you get such vivid visual imagery when you're during a REM dream. There's also hyperactivity in the primary motor and premotor cortices, as well as the cerebellum and the basal ganglia. And these probably account for why you often report movement during these REM dreams. The other important structures to know about are the pontine tegmentum, the thalamus, the basal forebrain, and the limbic and paralimbic structures, specifically the anterior cingulate cortex, the hippocampal formation, and the amygdaloid complex. Now these are all parts of the brain that together are really important for emotional processing and they're probably responsible for the really intense emotional aspects of REM sleep dreaming. There's also increased activity in other areas like the medial prefrontal cortex or the medial temporal lobe and posterior cingulate cortex. Now these parts of the brain are implicated in memory and self-referential processing. So there's obviously quite a large proportion of the brain that becomes hyperactive during REM cycles. But interestingly, during REM sleep, there are a lot of parts of your brain that are not very active. And these are the parts that are probably giving you the really dreamy qualities that you're experiencing. For example, sometimes when you're dreaming, you might see something from the first person perspective, like you're seeing it through your own eyes. Other times, it will be like you're watching yourself do something. That's because your right inferior parietal cortex is hypoactive or really turned down. And that's the part of your brain that contributes to representing yourself or comparing yourself to other things, just like being in the third person. All the other parts of your brain that are really important for cognitive control and orienting you in time, place, as well as testing what's in front of you, these are all in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the orbital frontal cortex, and they're also turned right down. And that's probably also why you can't remember your dreams afterwards. So those are the main parts of your brain that are either ramped up or turned down during REM dreaming. So now let's quickly touch upon NREM sleep and dreams. NREM dreams and sleep are a much more emergent part of dream research and probably a little more methodologically robust because researchers have been able to use up-to-date computational algorithms and new methods of analysis. 
Examples of this are like using machine learning algorithms that look at visual imagery during sleep onset. But when we look specifically at EEG recordings following awakening from N2 of NREM, dreamers would often get decreased low frequency and increased high frequency power in both parietal and occipital lobes, including the medial and lateral occipital lobes, as well as the precuneus and posterior cingulate gyrus. Despite knowing all of these fascinating bits of neural machinery, it's been more than 50 years since we learned about REM sleep and started trying to figure out how and why we dream. The most accepted theory of why we dream is that when we sleep, we're trying to reactivate and consolidate memories, essentially trying to compartmentalize new things that we've learned. It seems that there's still a really long way to go until we truly understand how and why we dream, and we still haven't got much further than the ancient Egyptians or Greeks. If you want more videos like this talking about popular neuroscience topics, let me know down in the comments section and we'll try and make some more of these for you. Don't forget to subscribe and see you during the next video.